Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. This issue we're interpreting for you is the literary masterpiece Jean Christophe by French author and Nobel laureate Romain Roland. Jean Christophe is a ten-volume novel. Romain Roland's Nobel Prize win was largely attributed to this work, with the citation stating that he depicts in his literary works noble ideals and possesses sympathy and love for truth when portraying characters of various types. Romain Roland idolized the German musician Ludwig van Beethoven. He saw many admirable qualities in Beethoven, kindness, resilience, sincerity, courage, and a dedication to serving humanity through music. Inspired by Beethoven, Roland decided to create a more idealized protagonist for his novel, Jean Christophe, to express his own philosophy of life. At the beginning of the 20th century, Romain Roland completed the serialization of Jean Christophe, which sparked a wave of heroism in France. At that time, more than 30 years had passed since the Franco-Prussian War, and while the French people enjoyed relative peace and prosperity, they were spiritually languishing, particularly among the upper class, where a sense of nihilism prevailed. Jean Christophe, representing heroism, injected a positive vitality into the French people. When World War I broke out, many young Frenchmen, inspired by Jean Christophe, rushed to the battlefield with fervor, sacrificing their youthful lives. This phenomenon led Romain Roland to reflect on himself. However, that is a story for later analysis. Before delving into the story of Jean Christophe, let's first understand why Romain Roland was able to create such a vivid and convincing character. This brings us to the lifelong passion of the author, music. Romain Roland was born into a prosperous family, and under the influence of his mother, Antoinette, he developed a love for music. Works by masters such as Haydn, Beethoven, and Mozart were like a form of faith to him. He was so inspired by Beethoven's Seventh Symphony that he abandoned the life path his father had planned for him. After entering the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, Romain Roland chose to study history instead of mathematics. In his sophomore year, a significant event occurred in Romain Roland's life. At that time, Leo Tolstoy wrote an article criticizing the immortality of art. Since the article mentioned Beethoven and Shakespeare, Roland mustered the courage to write a letter to Tolstoy, defending his idols and artistic principles. Surprisingly, Tolstoy replied a few months later, explaining that he opposed hypocritical modern art and believed that true art aims to convey the noblest and most beautiful emotions of humanity. Art should unite humanity and serve humanity. This idea subsequently became an integral part of Romain Roland's creative principles. After graduating from university, Romain Roland received a scholarship to study in Rome. It was there that he met his mentor, a noblewoman named Meissenberg, whose name may be unfamiliar to us, but her friends were all well-known figures, including Nietzsche and Wagner. Meissenberg guided Roland to acquaint himself with German culture and encouraged him to pursue literary writing. Upon returning to France, Romain Roland wrote a biography of Beethoven as a preliminary attempt which unexpectedly received a remarkable response. He then turned his writing aspirations toward Michelangelo, but he discovered that the artist was a victim of his own talent, with weak willpower. This was not the image Roland wanted to promote. He began to realize that he had to create a character that fully embodied his own ideals in order to effectively convey his heroism to the public. That character became Jean Christophe. Speaking of heroism, let's briefly review history. The original heroes were semi-divine figures in ancient Greek mythology who could achieve miracles on their own. Of course, over time, heroes transitioned from gods to humans. In Romain Roland's mind, a hero was a mortal with a flesh and blood body, possessing a noble spirit, unwavering determination, the ability to withstand the blows of fate, and the capacity to resist destiny. From 1904 to 1912, Romain Roland spent eight years serializing the story of Jean Christophe, depicting his entire life, personal growth, struggles, the evolution of his thoughts and character, the hardships he experienced, and of course, his hard-earned achievements. Future generations often refer to such lengthy novels as river novels. Interestingly, the first sentence of Jean Christophe begins with, The sound of a river rose behind the house. 
Romain Roland uses the flow of a river as a metaphor for the river of life, elevating the scope of the work while also indicating the setting of the story, a small German town situated by the river. Then, Romain Roland's writing shifts from the surging river to describing the cold and sparse furnishings inside the house. He arranges a dialogue between Jean Christophe's mother and grandfather to help readers understand the relationships between the characters. Jean Christophe's grandfather was once the conductor of the Duke's orchestra. He looked down on his son's maid-turned wife, believing that their mismatched marriage ruined his son's prospects. However, he was reasonable enough to recognize that his daughter-in-law was a kind and diligent girl. His son, despite being a cellist, was actually a hopeless case. Where was the cellist at this time? He was at a tavern carousing and seeking pleasure. Meanwhile, Jean Christophe was still in his infancy, unaware of the hardships of life. We know that the story of Jean Christophe draws inspiration from Beethoven's life. Beethoven's mother was the daughter of a cook, and his father was a tenor with a drinking problem. This small family relied on the support of Beethoven's grandfather to make ends meet. Similarly, Jean Christophe's grandfather, though retired, sought to secure his son's position in the orchestra by ingratiating himself with the nobility. This made the young and sensitive Jean Christophe feel ashamed. He experienced his first taste of injustice in the world when he had a dispute while playing with aristocratic children. His mother not only failed to protect him but even scolded him in front of the nobility. The only bright spot in his childhood was music. Jean Christophe received a second-hand piano from his grandfather and unexpectedly discovered his musical talent and composition abilities. While his grandfather initially hoped for his son to achieve success but was disappointed when his son turned out to be a drunkard, he saw hope in his grandson and sought to mold him into a prodigy, bringing honor to the family. Encouraged by his grandfather, Jean Christophe composed numerous pieces of music, becoming somewhat conceited until his uncle's words woke him from his dream. His uncle was a peddler who wandered the streets and Jean Christophe's grandfather and father looked down on him for not being a royal musician like themselves. However, the uncle didn't mind. He was reserved and humble. Every six months, he would pass by Jean Christophe's house and bring gifts for everyone, then quietly leave early the next morning. Influenced by his family, Jean Christophe considered his uncle nothing more than a commoner who knew nothing about music. He showed his compositions to his uncle, hoping to impress him. But his uncle said, you want to compose songs to become a great person, and you want to become a great person to compose songs. It's like a dog chasing its own tail. This made Jean Christophe begin to reflect on the purpose of his creations. One night, his uncle knocked on Jean Christophe's window, inviting him for a nighttime journey through the countryside. They floated on the river, observing the shimmering ripples created by fish and the stars shining in the sky and listened to the music of nature. Jean Christophe realized that nature was the true source of inspiration and that he should not create solely for the sake of creating. His grandfather and father organized a concert for Jean Christophe, establishing him as a child prodigy and gaining the favor of the Duke. Grateful, his grandfather reached the end of his life, and Jean Christophe experienced the fear of death for the first time. With his grandfather gone, Life in Jean Christophe's family deteriorated day by day, and his father's alcohol addiction worsened. His father even sold the piano his grandfather had given him. This crossed Jean Christophe's line, and he had a fierce argument with his father. His father, suddenly awakened, promised to quit drinking. Unfortunately, just two days later, his father, intoxicated, died in a small ditch. The young Jean Christophe then took on the responsibility of supporting the family. Let's take a look at how Jean Christophe spends his day. He wakes up at 5 a.m. to compose music, then goes to wealthy households to teach in the morning. Without time for a proper meal, he rehearses at the theater during lunchtime, followed by his own practice. In the evening, he performs at the theater and then goes to the Duke's house to play the piano for one or two hours. This relentless schedule accompanies Jean Christophe through his rebellious phase. The title of the fourth volume of the novel is Resistance, as Jean Christophe's self-awareness begins to fully awaken. He forms his own likes and dislikes and judgments about musical works, no longer blindly trusting authorities, 
and sees through the tasteless preferences of the upper class. Jean Christophe expresses these opinions to his friends and colleagues, but it causes a major uproar in the small town because no one had dared to criticize the musical masters before. Some mock him, some slander him, and Jean Christophe becomes a traitor and even a madman in the eyes of the public. Feeling frustrated, Jean Christophe unknowingly follows in his father's footsteps and begins gambling and drinking excessively. One day, in his drunken state, he encounters his long-lost uncle, who calls him by his father's name, Manzivo. Jean Christophe thinks his uncle made a mistake, but his uncle coldly replies, You are Manzivo. This statement hits him like a blow to the head, making Jean Christophe realize that he is becoming like his father. He feels remorse for his recent aimless behavior, and his uncle encourages him to do his best. In his adolescent years, Jean Christophe's emotional life is far from calm. He meets a French actress who has come to perform in the local area. The actress tells him that in Paris, everyone is free. This is the first time Jean Christophe becomes interested in France. His small hometown is too stifling, and he yearns for a broader stage. Jean Christophe's second encounter with France is through a mysterious woman. One day, he meets a girl at the theater entrance who couldn't get a ticket, so he invites her to watch the show with him. However, the gossip-loving townspeople cause trouble, and the girl, who was originally a French-language teacher in a wealthy household, gets fired the next day because of the theater incident. When Jean Christophe sees the mysterious woman again, she is already seated on the train returning to France, and they lock eyes but miss the opportunity to meet. Will there be further developments in this relationship? We will reveal that later. Jean Christophe keeps getting into trouble one after another. He submits an article to a progressive newspaper, offending the Duke and getting expelled from the mansion, losing his job as a musician. With no support left, all his enemies come out attacking him. Lost and confused, he remembers his childhood idol, the musician Hasley. Many years ago, Hasley jokingly said that Jean Christophe could come find him when he grows up. Jean Christophe sees this as his last lifeline and travels overnight to the city where his idol resides. However, when he meets Hasley in person, he is deeply disappointed. The once-spirited musician has become bitter and cynical, losing his passion for creating music and mocking Jean Christophe for having hope in life. Faced with continuous setbacks, Jean Christophe contemplates leaving his hometown but hesitates to leave his elderly mother behind. However, turning points in life often occur unexpectedly. A group of German soldiers intrude into a local countryside dance and start harassing the girls. Jean Christophe comes to the rescue, injuring one of the soldiers and causing himself significant trouble. To avoid imprisonment, he has no choice but to escape across the border on a night train. Thus, in the whims of fate, he becomes a fugitive and arrives in Paris. As a newcomer in Paris, Jean Christophe can barely speak French and has very little money in his pocket. He recalls a childhood friend who opened a shop in Paris and thinks of seeking refuge with them. However, to his surprise, news of him injuring a German soldier has already spread, and his childhood friend, wanting to avoid trouble, gives him fifty francs to send him away. With no other options left, another fellow named Jan, a fellow countryman, comes to his aid. Not because they have a deep connection or because Jan is particularly virtuous, but because Jan is a speculator who has thrived in Paris. He knows nothing about music, but he keenly recognizes Jean Christophe's talent and sees an opportunity to profit from it. So, Jan leads Jean Christophe into high society, introducing him to the upper class and hoping to promote him so that when Jean Christophe becomes famous, Jan can also benefit. Unfortunately, Jean Christophe doesn't fit in with the Parisian salons, and the wealthy regard him as a foreign bumpkin. Perhaps he has some musical talent, but who really cares? In high society, music is merely a decoration, a pastime for entertainment. Jean Christophe feels both disappointed and frustrated. He had expected Paris to be a new world, with new music, but in the end, it's not much different from the small German town. The wealthy are pretentious seeking fame and flattery. He can't help but wonder if this is the France he had longed for. In another boring salon, 
Jean Christophe meets a young poet named Olivier, and they instantly connect. Both are enamored by each other's talents and decide to rent a place together. Their instant connection has a reason behind it. Jean Christophe notices that Olivier's features resemble those of the mysterious woman he encountered before. And Olivier already knew about Jean Christophe's existence because the mysterious woman is his sister, who silently loved Jean Christophe. Olivier and his sister were born into a wealthy family, but their father's failed investments led to bankruptcy. After the death of their parents, the siblings relied on each other. The sister vowed to nurture her brother's talent, working multiple jobs, scrimping and saving, and even becoming a French tutor in Germany to earn money. It was during that time that she crossed paths with Jean Christophe. Later, Olivier got accepted into university, and the siblings embraced each other, thinking they could finally escape their hardships. However, due to years of toil, the sister's health deteriorated, and she passed away not long after. When Olivier was sorting through his sister's belongings, he discovered the letters she had written to Jean Christophe but never sent, learning about the short-lived love affair. Interestingly, Olivier's sister shares the same name as Roman Roland's mother, Antoinette. It is evident that Roman Roland imbued this character with the admirable qualities he saw in his own mother, such as resilience, humility, tenderness, and care. Antoinette is a pivotal character in the novel, often appearing only in memories, yet her presence deeply connects Jean Christophe and Olivier due to their admiration and love for the same woman. Jean Christophe tells Olivier that France has disappointed him. Olivier reassures him that those salons do not represent the real France. They are filled with opportunistic politicians, unscrupulous businessmen, idle rich people, and pretentious writers. So, where is the real France? The answer lies in the streets, behind the doors of every apartment. Just like the building where Jean Christophe and Olivier reside, there are single working men, families with children, widowed mothers and daughters, retired military officers, seemingly aloof but kind-hearted Jewish scholars, childless teacher couples. They are all ordinary people, each with their own happiness and troubles. In the seventh volume of the novel, Indoors, Roman Roland devotes a significant amount of ink to describing these tenants. Some readers may be puzzled, as it is not directly related to the main storyline. However, this leads us to another purpose of Roman Roland's creation of this novel. He aimed to bridge the gap between Germany and France. That's why he portrayed Jean Christophe as a musician born in Germany but living in France, allowing us to see the true France through the eyes of a German. The friendship between Jean Christophe and Olivier can also be seen as a symbol of German-French exchange. However, their relationship becomes distant when Olivier settles down and establishes a career. Meanwhile, Jean Christophe's music career starts to flourish. Critics begin to praise his work, renowned publishers request to publish his scores, and he even receives invitations to perform from embassies. It is said that Countess Pellegrin admires his music. Jean Christophe discovers that Countess Pellegrin is none other than Gracia, the little girl he taught to play the piano years ago. Gracia reveals that she had secretly admired Jean Christophe during her adolescence, and even wrote him a letter of encouragement after his failed performance. Unfortunately, he never received that letter and was unaware of her feelings. By the time they reunite, Gracia is already married to someone else. Later, Olivier's marriage hits a rough patch and his wife elopes with another man. Olivier starts paying attention to the lives of the working class and becomes involved in the labor movement. During a demonstration, Olivier accidentally kills a policeman while trying to save a young boy, forcing Jean Christophe to flee once again. This time, he escapes to Switzerland and seeks refuge with a fellow countryman who practices medicine there. Jean Christophe and the countryman's wife fall into a forbidden love affair but also feel guilty for betraying the countryman. They decide to commit suicide out of love for each other. However, when they are ready to pull the trigger, the bullet gets jammed. Jean Christophe chooses to escape and disappears into the mountains. For the next ten years, Jean Christophe lives in seclusion in the mountains. When he returns to Paris, he is a renowned and successful musician. He encounters Gracia once again, who has recently become a widow and is raising a son and a daughter on her own. After so many years, 
Will their old love be rekindled? On Jean Christophe's birthday, Gracia dresses her daughter to resemble how she looked when Jean Christophe first saw her. In the end, they cannot be together due to various reasons. However, their connection transcends romantic love and reaches a higher realm. In his final stage of life, Jean Christophe saw the world performing his compositions. He became a revered master in the eyes of musicians, even an idol for some young people who aimed to surpass him, just as he had criticized Brahms and Wagner in his youth. Now, no one can deny his musical achievements, but that is not what matters to him. What brings him the greatest joy is knowing that Olivier's son and Gracie's daughter have married, combining the cherished friendships and love that will endure. Jean Christophe reminisced about the loved ones who had passed away before him, his gentle mother, wise uncle, chance encounter with Andenard, his dear friend Olivier, and Gracie. Jean Christophe had a dream where he carried a child against the current throughout the night. When he reached the other side, he asked the child, Who are you? The child replied, I am the days yet to come. The story of Jean Christophe begins amidst the roaring river and concludes with crossing through the water. The ending scene is derived from a legendary story where a saint named Christopher carried Jesus across the river. Now we understand Roman Roland's deliberate choice of the name, as in his view, everyone carries their own God. Of course, this God can be interpreted in many ways, whether it be truth or goodwill. In any case, every person needs some faith within their hearts to live. Gracie is an Italian name that, when translated into English, means grace, signifying redemption. This reveals the exceptional position Gracie holds in Jean Christophe's heart among the many female characters. They support each other in life and become each other's spiritual reliance, crafting a platonic love story. Apart from the main female characters, Roman Roland also creates vivid and dynamic supporting female roles. For instance, Udo, an opera singer, is a spirited and ambitious woman. Udo's mother runs a small inn and shares a bed with many men, and Udo doesn't know who her biological father is. She yearns to leave the inn and become an actress, but she cannot read. Therefore, she runs away to work as a maid in a theater hotel, seizing the opportunity to steal books and learn to read. Finally, she encounters an actor who is willing to mentor her, but in reality, he desires her beauty and asks her to trade her chastity for his guidance. One time, Jean Christophe asked Udo what to do when encountering someone drowning. Her response was, hold their head down. Udo's attitude towards life can be described as fierce. It is shaped by her experiences, but we can sense her vibrant vitality, as she perseveres at all costs to finally stand on the stage becoming a radiant leading lady. Whether it is the main storyline of Chrysophy or the subplot of Udo, both are filled with hardships. This reflects the core idea that Roman Roland distilled from Beethoven's motto, through suffering, comes joy, Dirsch light and Freude. In Roman Roland's vision of heroism, one must undergo tribulations before experiencing a rebirth. The title of the ninth volume, Burning Thorns, aligns with this perspective. What is the illusion behind this title? In the book of Exodus in the Bible, it is written that Moses saw a burning bush, yet it was not consumed by the fire. That place later became the starting point for Moses leading the Israelites into Canaan. Just like Chrysophy, at the lowest point in his life, he was not defeated by fate or consumed like the burning thorns. Instead, it became his starting point, where he gained a deeper understanding of music and life during his seclusion merging with the universe. While reading the novel, we discover that although Chrysophy remains unmarried throughout his life, his emotional experiences are rich. The love lives of musicians such as Mozart and Wagner provided material for Roman Roland, but the closest resemblance is, of course, Beethoven. Although he could enter high society, marrying an aristocratic lady was impossible due to the difference in social standing. Beethoven and his student Josephine developed feelings for each other, but Josephine eventually married a count and, after his death, chose another nobleman. Beethoven's profound emotions transformed into musical compositions and love letters. In comparison, the love story between Chrysophy and Grace in the novel appears more idealized. Although they did not marry, 
They regarded each other as spiritual companions and silently protected one another throughout their lives. Aside from the emotional lives of musicians, we may also be curious about Roman Roland's judgment of other composers. Through the novel, we catch a glimpse of his preferences and dislikes, which may help us better understand his advocacy of heroism. Roman Roland acknowledges Mozart's genius, but compared to his talent, Mozart's character has few redeeming qualities. Handel, on the other hand, receives favor from Roman Roland, who believes that the composer was creating songs for the masses. He adds this universal spirit to Chrysophy as well. As for Berlioz and Schumann, Roman Roland considers them too weak, as they were influenced and controlled by their abundant emotions, which affected their creative careers. Regarding Wagner, Roman Roland expresses through Chrysophy's voice that he dislikes Wagner's pessimistic and sentimental heroism. Roman Roland's music criticism in Jean Christophe inevitably attracted criticism. After all, music reviews always involve subjective opinions. Later, his pacifist views expressed during World War I sparked another wave of criticism. As mentioned earlier, many passionate young individuals lost their lives on the battlefield inspired by Jean Christophe. Roman Roland began to reflect on why the heroism he advocated led young people to sacrifice their precious lives which was not what he wanted to see. During World War I, he was living in Switzerland and witnessed his two most admired countries, Germany and France, both suffering in the war. He published articles calling for peace to prevail over conflicts. However, such views were not well received during the war. Instead, he was accused of being a traitor. Nevertheless, this was consistent with Roman Roland's long-standing beliefs. He was a pacifist and internationalist. After receiving the Nobel Prize, he donated the prize money to the International Red Cross. In fact, in Jean Christophe, Roman Roland expressed his desire for mutual understanding and integration among different civilizations. Christophe was German, Olivier was French, and Gracia was Italian. The descendants of Olivier and Gracia eventually united in marriage with Christophe's intervention. Roman Roland placed his hopes in the people, just as he depicted the interactions between tenants of different races, religions, and backgrounds in the rented building, gradually developing curiosity about each other through Christoph's influence. Stefan Zweig paid tribute to Roman Roland in an open letter, praising Jean Christoph for bridging the relationship between young people from France and Germany. Zweig also advocated for a unifying spirit in Europe. Unfortunately, both friends witnessed France and Germany engaging in armed conflict twice. After publishing The World of Yesterday, Zweig took his own life in 1942. The World of Yesterday is Zweig's lamentation about the era he lived in, and this work, in some sense, predicted the decline of Roman Roland's heroism. In post-World War II French literature, a new wave of novels emerged, with anti-hero novels becoming mainstream, making heroism appear out of place and untimely. A hundred years later, how should we view Roman Roland's heroism? It is not about encouraging people to accomplish earth-shattering feats or achieve monumental accomplishments that will go down in history. It is a way of life, an attitude. What Roman Roland valued the most was tenacious vitality, just like Sisyphus, pushing the boulder up the hill day after day, even though it is destined to roll back down. Life is full of hardships, according to Roman Roland's perspective, but he would not compromise or give up. He chooses to struggle, even if failure is inevitable. Doing good, seeking truth, holding beliefs, having a concern for the people, bravely and fearlessly living on, taking control of one's destiny, and becoming one's own hero is enough. All right, we have finished interpreting the essential content of Jean Christophe for you. Let's recap the key points covered in today's discussion. First, Roman Roland created Jean Christophe to shape a more perfect image than Beethoven's and to embody his own heroism. In addition to writing novels, Roman Roland was also a significant music biographer and wrote biographies of Beethoven, Handel, and others. Second, we can view Jean Christophe as a Beethoven of his time. The heroism embodied by Jean Christophe is, in simple terms, an unwavering resistance against fate and using music to bring well-being to the masses. Third, Jean Christophe is the personal saga of the novel's protagonist, 
but Roman Roland also included numerous music critiques and comparisons of the French and German civilizations in the narrative, providing readers with additional insights. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.